Good morning and welcome to this, the fourth meeting of the Quality and Human Rights Committee in 2018. Can I make the usual request that electronic devices are switched to silent mode and mobile phones are off the table. Um, we have apologies this morning from our colleague David Torrance, uh, but we are joined by a substitute member this morning, Linda Fabiani. Welcome, Linda. Our first agenda item this morning is our continuation of the scrutiny of stage one of the historic sexual offences pardons and disregards bill and our in front of us today we have six uh, witnesses so quite a, a detailed panel and with us this morning and good morning and welcome and thank you for your written evidence that, that you have given us I'm looking forward to hearing from you this morning but with us this morning we have Anne-Marie Hicks from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, Gillian Maudsley of the Policy Executive Team at the Law Society of Scotland, Detective Superintendent Stuart Houston of the Specialist Crime Division of Police Scotland, Raymond McIntyre, who's a Criminal Records Manager with Police Scotland, Paul Tucock, who is the Director of Campaigns Policy and Research for Stonewall UK, and we will be joined by Derek Ogg, who's been held up and he'll be here soon, hopefully. Now, I'm going to open with quite a general question, just to get kicked off, and I'm looking, I've not got time to give you all an opening statement as such, but I'm looking for... Um, your feelings and your thoughts on the general principles of the bill and any key aspects that you think that we should be scrutinising. And Paul, I'll, I'll start with you at this end. OK, um, well, uh, thanks for inviting me to come up to, to give evidence. Um, uh, I, I mean, in short, Stonewall warmly welcomes um, the Scottish Government's bill um, and the approach that the Scottish Government is taking uh, on the bill. Um, I think we, we may um, get into more detail later about some of the differences between um, the approach here and in England and Wales. But certainly um, our two objectives for the legislation in England and Wales were to have an automatic pardon for um, both people, both living and um, uh, who have died, and uh, to widen the scope of the dis uh, disregard scheme in England. Uh, we, as you know uh, from evidence last week, we, we failed to achieve that first objective uh, in England and Wales, but we were really pleased to work with, across party with um, um, the government, Baroness Williams, the government spokesperson, the person, Lords and Lord Cashman, Lord Starkey and others to achieve um, a commitment to the second objective. And, and I'd be really pleased to talk a bit about some of the work that's been going on in the Home Office to widen the scope, because I think it's really important that the Scottish legislation is going through now because it gives the Home Office an, an opportunity to ensure that there's parity um, across all the United Kingdom um, on this issue, particularly around the disregard scheme. Paul Raymond. Good morning. Um, I'm here uh, on behalf of National System Support um, as Criminal Records Manager in that team. And um, we're here to support the idea of this bill um, and make sure that technically and practically anything that needs to be done um, with police records can actually be achieved. I'll leave it to my colleague Stuart, Stuart Houston, um, to explain the wider uh, policy and uh, support from Police Scotland um, that will be in that. Yeah, good morning. I think it's um, really essential a part of this, this bill that's going through and the fact that we as the police are able to recognise that there is people that have had uh, convictions uh, for offences that are now no longer relevant and are now, now competent. And the fact is we welcome that opportunity to be able to give the people out there who have been discriminated against in relation to the barred from certain occupations or even voluntary organisations due to a conviction that goes back a number of years. So I think it's really important uh, that we, and I'm really glad that we've been invited to take part in this today and the fact about how we can make that you know, I'm as most efficient process as we can because obviously a lot of the, the records are held, as, as Raymond has touched upon, by Police Scotland and make sure that we can do that um, quickly uh, and the most efficient way possible. Thank you very much. Gillian, the, the Law Society gave us a pretty detailed uh, submission, which we're grateful for, and, and, and it went into some aspects of the use of language. So in your opening remarks about the general principles, can you tell us a wee bit about why that's important, that change in the use of language as well? Thank you. Um, yes, we felt that um, the bill employed neutral terminology, which was similar to uh, the principles behind the Sexual Offences Scotland Act of 2009. 
and we felt that the use of language was important. Um, we recognise that it's not applying for women, which we address, um, but the language used in the past around these areas of convictions for same-sex activities have no place in Scotland now, as many of the terms were offensive and discriminatory. So that's why we welcomed, in particular, the drafting of the legislative intent behind the bill. And obviously, as a law society in general, as you happy to go over any points that are given in our submission. But again, in our role as part of a fairer, more just society, we obviously welcome the premise of the bill and very much support it. Thank you very much. Somebody. Um, it's, um, speaking last, I have to say I would endorse everything that's been said. I, I think it's an important piece of equality legislation. I think it helps to modernise our country and bring us to where we should be. I think it's really important that the purpose of the Act is set out right firmly and squarely in Section 1, really acknowledging the, the wrongfulness and discriminatory effects of past convictions. So the Crown Office would warmly welcome this legislation. So much for all of your, your opening remarks. It, it puts it into context for, for us here. I'm going to go to opening questions to your colleagues in the committee, and I'm starting with Alec Cole Hamilton this morning. Thank you, Convena. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for coming on uh, what I agree is a very historic and uh, important piece of legislation that we uh, have entrusted to us as a committee. Last week, we heard evidence from Tim Hopkins, who is the uh, chief exec of the Equality Network, and he um, made a, a very eloquent uh, pitch around this bill and, and in terms of uh, the importance of righting historic wrongs. One of the interesting examples that he gave us was where they have done this already internationally, and that is Germany. And um, in Germany, uh, it's the only country that we know of that is doing this, um, but it, they are offering a symbolic payment of compensation to those men who come forward for have, uh, to apply for the pardon and the disregard. They also receive a certificate uh, to that end. Um, this is a symbolism, and it's certainly not been something call, actively called for by uh, equalities or, or LGBT rights organisations, partly because um, the, the people that this applies to aren't thinking about money, they just want to see justice served and a historic wrong righted. But perhaps compensation is just the right thing to do. And I wonder um, if we could hear the reflections of the panel on whether they think <coughs> that that is something we should consider as part of this legislation. Oh, well, I'll start with Paul, I think, yeah. from Stonewall, particularly because you're a campaigning organisation. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I kind of think um, our mind is with uh, Tim on this, and I know Tim, Tim spoke about this briefly, and it's in uh, his written submission, that um, uh, the Equality Network uh, did do some research with um, uh, Gay and by Men in Scotland. Um, there was some, but quite a small uh, number of people who... Um, thought that compensation should be um, on the table. I think actually the wider question though is um, actually there are all sorts of historic wrongs um, um, uh, committed against uh, the wider LGBT plus communities in the past. Um, these historic convictions, these sexual offences convictions were particularly vicious, um, but there was discrimination throughout life um, and um, there would be a question about you know, where, where compensation should lie for any number of LGBT people that experienced discrimination in the past. Uh, in that sense, I think it would be um, unfair, actually, to compensate one part of the community who experienced one type of discrimination uh, and not look at um, compensation for other parts of the community. Uh, and that's uh, really the basis on which I'd say that it's probably not the right route to go down. Um, actually, the most important thing is that um, people have received that apology from the First Minister in Scotland, which was very important, I know, um, for those affected by um, uh, these uh, persecuted offences, was important to hear directly from the First Minister. Um, and that this legislation makes it quite clear that these crimes should never have, uh, these, effect, these convictions should never have been um, made against uh, gay and bi men in the past. I think that is the most important thing. Would any of the other panellists like to offer reflections on that? I, I think it was more the fairness issue. I was really interested to read Tim's evidence and I thought he made a lot of really compelling points, but I think it's always about fairness, about people who perhaps maybe weren't prosecuted, but perhaps I had to change their life and, and not 
you know, do certain things that they would have wanted to do to live their life in a, in a normal way because of the way the law was. So in a way, people who were prosecuted were not the only ones who were subject to discrimination. And I think it's difficult because there were people who perhaps have died, who maybe wouldn't get compensation, perhaps who don't take advantage of the scheme, you know, who are not aware of it. So I think it would end up only being for a, a small proportion of, of people for the reasons Paul said. Thank you. And if I may, Convener, just uh, to follow up on another line of questioning I had last week, which was about the idea that, um, well, not the idea, the reality that some of these men in particular um, will have um, been sentenced or uh, prosecuted in other jurisdictions outside of the United Kingdom and living in the UK still have a criminal record um, for a crime which is no longer illegal. Um, what is the process by which we can offer a pardon and disregard to people in that category? convictions that are, are overseas, um, they, I would refer to Raymond as his role as obviously the records manager might have a, a knowledge of that about how they would be recorded, but again, he would have to see what was actually recorded and held within Scotland in relation to convictions that were out with our jurisdiction. In terms of records that are overseas, um, it would uh, they would only come to light if there was uh, active requests um, through court, fiscals and, and police uh, lines to actually bring that information into the UK. Um, in terms of the wider UK, um, information that is available through the Police National Computer, which is England and Wales uh, Central Repository, um, any information that Scotland has that is recorded on there is directly linked to the, the criminal records in Scotland and we would therefore manage them um, to the same extent that we would manage any information that is on criminal history system. Um, England and Wales uh, police forces would manage the information that is uh, theirs um, held in England and Wales under the disregard scheme that's uh, in place in England and Wales. So hope that covers it for you. Yeah, no, that, that's very helpful. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Mary Fee. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, panel. I wonder, um, perhaps, if I could start um, with Paul first, because I'm particularly interested to hear the impact of the legislation in England and Wales, um, how it was publicised, what impact it's had on the LGBT community, but also has it had any impact on attitudes towards the LGBT community? Because there has been, and I don't need to tell you, long, long-standing um, discrimination um, against the community. Has this legislation helped to reduce that in any way? I, I think the, um, I think the, the real impact of this legislation is to indicate the progress that we've made. So it's to confirm, particularly for those that were that experienced the the sharp end of these um, these offences. Um, that um, they they should never have been prosecuted, and that the government acknowledges that, that the government was wrong, and that the criminal justice system was wrong to pursue them in the way they did. Um, so that is a very important impact uh, for a relatively small group of people um, um, now, um, but so important for those individuals, and also for the wider LGBT community, is another marker of the progress that. Um, has been made in attitudes. Uh, I mean, obviously, I won't expand on all the other areas where there's still um, many, uh, many um, areas where we still need to go further. Um, in terms of uh, one of the key lessons I would like to pick out from this question, one of the key lessons from England and Wales to learn is the absolute confusion between what a pardon is and what a disregard is. And that continues in England and Wales. And it's a major problem for increasing the uptake of the disregard scheme for people who would be eligible uh, for their crimes to be disregarded. People um, have not understood, um, and this is within the LGBT community, despite um, Stonewall's best efforts, despite the best efforts of other LGBT organisations to explain the difference. When people hear the word pardon, they think that means the crime has been deleted often. Um, and actually that means that if they do uh, if they do have a, a historic sexual offence in particular that, that um, um, will come up on uh, a barring scheme, a criminal records report, um, uh, and if they apply for a job where that is relevant, um, they, will, um, they will still um, receive the impact. And people just really don't understand that. Um, and I think 
One thing I would say is that um, because the Scottish legislation does provide an automatic pardon, it gives you, actually gives you a better foundation in which to explain that difference because you can very clearly say um, what this is saying is that the government and the justice system was wrong to prosecute you in this way and that's why you're receiving a pardon. However, those records do still exist and if you'd like that to be removed from the record so that it doesn't come up on any barring scheme check, then please apply for a disregard um, and that will be processed in the, in the most efficient way possible. I think being able to get that message across is so important. So you, it does mean that the Scottish Government will need to invest some resources and time in publicising that and really focus on that difference, um, particularly with the LGBT community. So working with LGBT organisations, I'd suggest. Okay. So do you think it should just be the Scottish Government that should campaign or should LGBT organisations campaign? Do you think there should be guidance along with the bill? That would help. Yeah, ab 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 absolutely, and I, I do think it's a partnership. But I think it's important that it is a partnership because of the L LGBT organisations have access to those networks, um, uh, particularly because we're talking about um, an older LGBT population, largely who will um, be eligible for um, these disregards, relatively older. Um, um, although there are instances of um, these offences being used right up until repeal. Um, uh, in 2003 uh, in the UK. So um, the, actually the, the age, the, the population is still quite wide that could be eligible. Um, I think it's really important that's a partnership though. Um, and it's not just the LGBT organisations that are relied on for that, that the um, Scottish Government uses the opportunity of passing legislation to use it as a point of, of publicity um, and think about how to reach all of those um, gay and by men that could potentially be eligible for disregard. Do you think that'd be a, a short campaign or a, a long campaign to really keep pushing home the message that you, you can apply for this? Um, I mean, realistically, um, it, I think it's important for it to be um, a well-resourced and thought-out short campaign. Um, I think um, uh, it's important that there are resources um, um, and perhaps this is this is where the partnership with LGBT organisations can be picked up. So that there are resources so that the LGBT information services have the right um, guidance for people who are inquiring about the disregard scheme later uh, in time. But the reality is that there is so much um, information and noise in society at the moment that um, actually, um, if you put the right resources in the thought processes into making sure that you use this opportunity the legislation passing, I think that could do the trick and perhaps um, you'll have a slightly better uptake um, than we've had so far in England and Wales. One of the areas that we um, asked Tim Hopkins about last week when he was here was the, um, the impact on perhaps applying for a disregard because it can be very traumatic because you're reliving things that happened, not only for the individual concerned, but, but for their family. So in, in England and Wales, was any support made available to people? I'm, I'm talking emotional, um, psychological support to help them through that process. And is it something that we should consider up here? No, um, frankly, no. Um, there, there, um, there has been no... Um, structured or funded support, uh, emotional support for um, uh, people applying for d a disregard. Um, apart from that, offered through normal services of LGBT organisations. Mm. So, for instance, um, when the original Protection and Freedoms Act in 2012 was passed, mm. um, we developed guidance, which we published on our website. We received inquiries through our telephone information service. And we did provide signposting to um, to some uh, other services, including counselling services that were available to, to people. Um, so we provided that sort of signposting work through our normal core work, information work that we do, and other organisations did as well, um, and the LGBT Foundation in Manchester and other organisations. Thank you. Linda, have you on that point here? Yes, uh, on that specific point that, that uh, Mary just raised... <laughs> There's obviously going to be times when great sensitivity is required. Um, and I just wonder how we can ensure confidentiality through the process. Would you like me to answer that one? Oh, you go first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, 
probably is something for um for, for you guys to respond on in terms of thinking about the process here in scotland i i, I all i would say is i think that is absolutely important um and um i know it's something that um the team at the home office um have a view on and and have regard to in the work they've been doing since 2012 um in the process they they've put together i think one interesting element of um confidentiality perhaps um you should consider is that there may be cases and i know there are cases of um individuals who were prosecuted um under these offenses in the past who have since um changed their gender identity and there is a real issue about exposure of that transition um in the w the way that so i think um due regard should be thought to how the process deals with potential cases like that Linda's question because there, there is an issue about how records are sourced, where they're kept mm -hmm. and how they are then used in the disregard process. So maybe you can give us some insight in that. Yeah, absolutely. I think as a, as a crucial part of it is making sure that that process of application, if that is to come um, from to the Scottish Government, first of all, about how that is a secure, you know, a secure network that's allowed that to feed back into the criminal record system that's held within Police Scotland. The, the, good, the good part of that is in the fact that it is contained within one department who have access to those, and anybody's criminal record is a matter of, of confidential uh, material. So I think we just need to make sure that we are um, that, that process is robust to say how the checks are done um, and to say what information that we still hold. Um, and I, th I think that, that's something that we need to make sure that we have in place uh, at the right time so that there is a clear, and again, I come back to my first point about being a clear and efficient process and the fact that it can be done quite quickly for someone to come in. The, the issue is then going to be about trying to find information that may be held you know, in historically. Uh, it's trying to locate that information and make sure that um, we're in a, a position to give um, the feedback and the information about um, what relates to that uh, individual conviction. Yes, it's just in, in respect of the uh, partly the language around the legislation in terms of the disregard, whether a criminal offence is removed or deleted. I think it, it's interchangeable and different between the UK legislation and the Scottish legislation that we're debating today. We heard a really interesting argument from Tim Hopkins last week about the importance of not deleting criminal records um, about this, even though we can disregard them, have them disapplied so that they don't appear on things like PVG checks and the rest of it, but the actual physical tangible record should be kept intact because we don't want to preside unwittingly over a kind of revisionist history where, you know, generations from now we'll, we'll go back and look at the criminal record and not find that this was a, a stain on our conscience. Um, where does the panel sit on that, whether we should be actively removing these records entirely or whether we should retain the historical record but disapply them for everything else. Do you want to start with Paul? Sorry. Or, or maybe Stuart for a change. Stuart may be in a position to answer that. Yeah. yeah I, I, I think it's an interesting point around the, the revisionist history idea. Um, to my knowledge, the criminal history system isn't the archive of uh, criminal records for Scotland, and that tends more to be the court procedures. It is not court procedures that are used uh, when it comes to uh, vetting and or uh, the barring um, sort of moves that are around there. So in practical terms, um, the removal of that information from the criminal history system um, would be the removal of unnecessary information for sight of active police officers and the removal of uh, unwanted information for use by disclosure agencies. So um, there are certain places where the information can be removed without actually damaging the integrity of history. Um, and there are other places where perhaps you're absolutely right um, that the record that uh, such activities and um, such legislation existed and where people persecuted under it um, would not be removed. So it's about striking that balance and that is about the analysis that needs to be done about how we go about applying a disregard scheme and what we actually do when we make such decisions under the disregard scheme. Okay, I'm going to bring Gail in because it's on, on records um, and I know Gail, last week you had pursued the cross-border records and the National Police records as well, I think. Um, 
Yeah, thanks, Convener. Good morning, panel, and thank you for coming in and giving your evidence. Um, it's, it's to actually follow on from a couple of points that have been made. Um, Tim Hopkins, um, in his written representations last week, um, said that there were a small percentage of people who would have liked to have seen disregards like the pardons being automatic, and we've heard various reasons as to why that would not be possible. Um, I wondered if uh, Police Scotland could tell us just what the, the difficulties in making a, a, a disregard automatic would be. Let me answer this first of all. I, I think we need to look at, uh, I've said that in the written submission we've given as well, about a case-to-case -case basis, because there are some convictions that will be and still on people's records out there uh, where some of that activity may still be illegal. If you look at the consent issue, if you look back historically at sodomy, for example, when that was recorded back prior to really 1981, um, there was no di distinction between consensual and non-consensual. So that is a really, really difficult one for you suddenly to be able to strike off in the fact to say that that was definitely consensual. There's other areas that the circumstances of the case you would have to look at in relation to um, was that um, a through coercion, imbalance of power, what would now be a breach of trust. Again, we would need to really look at that to make sure that that is the correct thing to do, particularly with that common law legislation. The statutory offences that were in place are probably a bit more clear cut in relation to it was age. It was, you know, the age um, going from 21, 18, 16. That's probably a bit more easier to, to understand, but it's that other aspect that we would need to make sure there was no other what would still be determined criminal behaviour within that offence. Okay. Yeah, I can expand on that. Um, it's just absolutely right. It is about the context and the circumstances and uh, getting access to whatever information is still in existence about that context and circumstances. Um, so the, uh, the exceptional circumstance would be um, where there is, uh, th there's coercion or, or, or age factors which said that you know, this is still a crime. And on the other uh, end of that scale would be um, where there is clear evidence that, that this was nothing more than persecution of a person's uh, sexuality. And uh, making sure that there was a disregard scheme put in place um, that enabled us to use that information as efficiently and as effectively as possible would really be the, the, the target going forward about what it is that we want to achieve. Um, the idea of an automatic uh, disregard scheme and dealing with everything um, on one fell swoop would be challenging. Um, the other end of that scale is to say that we will only deal with it on a, a come to notice basis, i.e. by a application by application, um, are the two sides of the scale. There may be something that can be practically achieved that's uh, somewhere in the middle around that, that uh, wipes down quite an, a substantial amount of information that we know was uh, based on persecution and retain some of the stuff that maybe needs a little more investigation, a bit more context. And it's about, uh, and I think um, it was Paul who used the word partnership and getting the right people to be involved in actually deciding how we actually structure and go about this. And in our written evidence, we've suggested that there are there is some work that can be done um, around uh, being more effective, efficient, and uh, consistent about the way we apply it. And um, so just for the record, if, if this, and, and this will come to pass, and then it's publicised, and there's a, a, a gentleman out there that wants to apply, um, how does the process work? How do they go about it? Where do they get the form? Where does the form go? How does the record get searched? How does it then get taken off? Just a step-by-step -step explanation on how it actually works. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think I can maybe cover the first part in, in relation to as part of the, the, the discussion that we've had in relation to Scottish Government team um, regarding this was about who was going to be that person that put out the application form. Uh, and originally, the, as you can see from the written submission, there was a suggestion that that should have been the police, which um, we don't feel is correct. It's not, we shouldn't really be that decision maker. It's actually because we don't hold all the information either, which is a big part of that. So again, uh, we would see that the, the application process is through. The Scottish Government is then passed 
in a secure and confidential format to the police to allow them to do the background checks from the records that are held by Police Scotland uh, and any other partner agency who might have information at that time, which again would bring in the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and possibly the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service as well, who might hold information. I think we need to have a sort of wider aspect of that. I wonder if I could just add about the application process. When I would fully endorse what's been said about making sure that the guidance, I mean, I'm assuming there will be guidance and it's very well trailed. And the reason for that is because the people applying, it must be easy for them, but I do envisage that on occasion there may be the role of a solicitor. So it is very, very important that, that, that the process, that they know that they can go and get advice, although hopefully the process is easy enough that they wouldn't necessarily require to get advice. And that's why we reflected on the question of legal aid or legal assistance, um, advice and assistance if required. And I think that's an important point because you're now having people to take an active step to get something that the government is recognising or that recognising they're required to. So if needing support, and I'm also thinking of the more vulnerable because a number of these could well fall into our vulnerable and supported categories. So I think as well as talking about partnerships, some of your third sector organisations that are perhaps working with people with learning difficulties, etc. I think they also have a role in support. You've talked about confidentiality, as have the legal profession in supporting where required. Okay, um, and just one little last question, and um, it's for Paul. Um, Again, to go back to the um, automatic disregard, we also spoke with uh, Tim last week about how there probably be a percentage of men that have this in their past and they want to keep it in their past. And just a comment on that. Yeah, I think that's true. And uh, in some ways, which is that, that's why I, we warmly welcome the fact that there is an automatic pardon, because actually that's an important symbolic um, acknowledgement for those who don't wish to um, rake up the past, as, as, as you, as you uh, explain, um, who don't wish to go back to that quite difficult time in their lives. Um, and, oh, and if uh, it may well be that they are not affected by the, the continuing impact of having that, re that criminal record existing. So there is actually, for them, um, no reason to, to apply for disregard. And that's absolutely fine and the right thing to do for them. Um, and that's why um, the automatic pardon is, is so important. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Uh, apologies for missing the opening uh, remarks, if there are any. Um, actually, before I move on to my own personal questions, I wanted to follow up on a comment made by uh, Mr McIntyre. Uh, if I was to read you correctly, the situation at the moment is that in Scotland, I suppose, and indeed in the rest of the UK, it's a proactive process to apply for the <clears throat> disregard, and then at the other end of that spectrum is an automatic disregard, which we've taken in evidence that that may be complex, complicated, and perhaps even unwarranted by those who it would benefit. Uh, did you, during your statement, make a suggestion there may be somewhere in the middle that there could be room for movement in Scotland as we, you know, bearing in mind this, this bill hasn't passed yet, uh, of some sort of semi-automatic disregard process for certain types of offences, for example, uh, certain types of statutory offences, which where there's a very clear-cut um, situation, uh, as opposed to maybe the more complex ones where there are multiple offences committed, therefore it may be more difficult to have that automatic disregard, or indeed where there are common law offences taking place, which again, as Mr Houston pointed out, are, are more complex. So I, I do wonder, is, are, are we missing a trick here if we just assume that the proactive apply for process is the only option available to us. Yeah, I, th I think that's a fair paraphrasing of, of what I'm suggesting. Um, there, we, we live in modern uh, times and that there's modern technology there and uh, there perhaps are opportunities for us to do um, data analysis that enables us, as you quite rightly say, to um, find some of the information that's there that makes it very clear that uh, perhaps this was an information that, that shouldn't be there and perhaps we could get rid yeah. of. Um, but again, it, I'm a record manager. I'm saying the opportunities are there. I would uh, very much welcome a sort of partnership approach to that about saying to people, what is the art of the possible here? And how can we best go about making uh, the, the blanket pardon that is there 
and to disregard scheme as efficient and as effective as possible. Um, and, and as fair as possible for everyone. Um, so we're not forcing people to apply, but uh, th there is the opportunity that if you're worried about it, you can confirm that it's, it's been done. So yes, um, your summation was correct. There is a middle ground. Uh, maybe I could uh, follow on from that then, Paul. Could I ask you if, uh, <laughs> if you think that would pose any um, problems in the sense that people who fell under this perhaps new third category of automatic disregard for certain types of offences, would they actually want to be contacted or notified that they had offences disregarded? Or would that create a whole a new, new set of problems for people getting letters through the door they didn't expect or even want? I mean, I have to say, I haven't, I haven't considered this, this issue essentially because there wasn't a similar approach in England and Wales and, uh, or, or a suggestion that this was going to be, that any sort of uh, alternative approach might be feasible. Um, I think that would be a live issue. Uh, there are, as um, uh, um, uh, your colleague was saying, there are people who would rather just keep this in the past. It's a, a difficult time. And I can imagine receiving a, a letter from... Um, uh, from Police Scotland or from the Scottish Government to say, oh, your, your crime's been disregarded, might actually create an emotional issue which didn't necessarily need to be there. Um, so I'd suggest, yeah, you would need to consult on any approach um, um, with the LGBT community on, what, uh, on how that would work and whether there would be any proactive contact. I'll, I'll leave that there and move on to my original question, if that's okay. Uh, just that threw up a very interesting um, uh, third option, perhaps. Uh, I asked a question last week around um, the armed forces and those who either currently or previously served in the armed forces. And I'll specifically reference those who either, uh, and I'll use the phrase committed a crime, uh, as it was then, in Scotland, but as a member of the armed forces, perhaps, were disciplined or, or prosecuted under national or English and Welsh law uh, as a member of the forces, even though they're in Scotland, or perhaps members of the armed forces who currently reside in Scotland or retired and now live in Scotland, will they be able to take advantage of uh, the Scottish process or because of that status they would have to do this for England and Wales? I'll let you go. And sets out the, the offences um, to which this would apply uh, and also provides provision for Scottish ministers to regulate for other offences if, if that comes to light. But I don't think this would cover anything that would have occurred in another jurisdiction. Um, and obviously if it was armed forces, um, I think that would be within the um, UK and in, in England and Wales. The conviction would that the pardon scheme down there would have to be used. I think from... Uh, from a Scottish records perspective, um, there would be, I believe, and I'm open to being corrected in terms of uh, the legislative uh, instruments, but the Army Act of 1955 would perhaps encompass any action that had been taken against people in such circumstances. And it would be a, a matter of seeing whether or not uh, any of that particular uh, legislation was recorded um, within uh, Police Scotland's records and therefore what the provenance of those records were, whether or not they came um, from a prosecution in England and Wales or whether they came through from a courts martial or whether it was part of a case that was held in a Scottish court. Um, but it, it would then come under uh, a question of challenging the records that are held in Scotland and therefore be covered by the Scottish Bill. Uh, maybe before uh, someone else steps in, it's worth pointing out that people were dismissed from the armed forces not for committing any specific offence that may have been legal in the civil world, uh, illegal, uh, but actually were dismissed purely for being LGBT or, or gay in, in this respect. Um, and this bill, it seems, doesn't go any way to perhaps address, nor, nor does the English and Wales legislation address that particular issue of, of, of those people being pardoned or, or those disciplinary actions being disregarded in any way. Does anyone have any further views on that? I'm just going to say, obviously, that the purpose of the bill is to deal with previous convictions. And I, I would kind of go back to Paul's opening remarks about the fact that 
you know, there have been a whole manner of discriminatory actions towards LGBTI people um, over decades, um, and that will not just be in the armed forces. I'm sure many people will have um, experienced discrimination in the workplace, either not getting jobs, being dismissed, or experiencing harassment and discrimination. So um, I, I think, as I say, there are wider um, uh, discriminatory uh, wrongs which have occurred. I think the purpose of this bill is quite um, specific about um, dealing with previous convictions and I think it would be widening the scope of it to, to bring in some other aspects like that. I would endorse that. I, I would say that um, actually the the whole issue of the way um, um, as in the past men were dealt with in the armed forces for, for being gay or bi is an important issue. There hasn't been any sort of any um, clear um, acknowledgement by the state on that, that experience, but I do think that is a separate issue, and it would m uh, muddy the waters of this bill if you you brought that into scope. Um, but I think that's still something that that should be addressed. I mean, Stonewall works very closely now with all of the armed forces uh, working to improve their LGBT inclusion. They've, they have they have progress hugely featuring our top 100 employers so i'm sure um the armed forces should certainly collaborate on um any um uh, work in that area <coughs> much mary fee you wanted to come back in yes um, thank you convener i just had a couple of um, follow-up points first to, to jillian when um your submission talks about um legal aid and i know you um covered some aspects of legal aid when um, Gail asked you a couple of questions. And I just want to be clear, given that it's going to be a relatively small number of men that are going to go through the process of applying for a disregard, and given that we're righting a wrong that should never have been done to these individuals, do you think that the legal aid should be automatic? I think that's a very interesting question um, because I, I have thought, we have thought about that aspect because it is writing or wrong. I think it's a matter for government, um, the question, but if we just go back to the question of legal aid, obviously we want to make the, the process should be as simple as possible. There is no canvassing here that there should be a complex system that necessarily requires legal intervention or legal support. But were somebody to require it, they would be obviously able to have civil advice and assistance in the actual initial process. But if there was a process to the court, that's representation, that's civil legal aid. And my understanding there is it would be subject to the usual legal aid tests of financial eligibility, etc. So I think there is a question perhaps for government to perhaps address in that matter with regard to if it's something that is being acknowledged as the First Minister did, that it's righting or wrong. And if we look back to the purpose of why we're doing this and Alan Turin in the first place, then perhaps following it through, why should someone be disadvantaged by having to get something that the state says that they can get? But I do think it's a matter for yourselves and obviously for the government. That's very interesting. Paul, perhaps if I could come to you, Paul, um, just to follow up on that. In England and Wales, individuals that applied for the disregard, were they given any financial support to go through the process? Uh, n n no, um, not, as, not as far as I'm aware. And the other question I wanted um, to ask, and it was again, it was it was to you, Paul. The, the bill here, um, as drafted, contains um, a, a larger number, if you like, of, of, of sexual um, historic sexual <coughs> offences. The, the legislation here includes, for example, importuning. And I know um, in, in England and Wales, there's, there's an order making power that additional offences can be added in. Has there been any um, indication that because of the list of offences that, that are included in our legislation? One, do you think we've got the right list? And secondly, in England and Wales, is there any indication they're going to include additional offences? Um, yes, so um, we have been working with the Home Office since um, the Policing and Crime Act, which is where uh, legislation was placed, uh, was passed. So there is a, the, the team that works on the disregard scheme is working on that regulation at the moment. We've been providing some evidence in case law to demonstrate why other offences need to be included. So the, that includes importuning or assisting by men, which is a major, uh, which is actually the key offence because that's where there have been most um, uh, rejections of disregard applications amongst the the, the, the ones that have uh, come through in England and Wales since 2012. Um, and certainly um, there was a case um, 
a case of the use of that um, um, that law, Section 32 law, um, rather up until 1995, that was taken to a constituent of an MP, uh, Matthew Pennyconnick MP. Uh, his application was rejected just because it wasn't within the scope, and his experience had been a similar one to ones uh, uh, that Tim talked about last week. Um, that he uh, essentially chatted up a plainclothes police officer in a sting in 1995 in a bar, at, outside a bar in Soho and was persuaded to receive a caution, uh, which now is a permanent sexual offence um, on the record. So it's really important that that, that, that offence and other offences are included, particularly those that are permanently on barring scheme records, sexual offences. Um, and there is a commitment from government to do that. They're very clear that they will include Section 32 in import tuning, and we've been making, um, uh, providing case law, so other, uh, particularly for armed forces, there are armed forces um, offences which are not included at the moment, so things like disgraceful conduct and scandalous conduct, which we have made representations that need to be included. Um, so it's actually, as I said in my opening statement, it's really useful um, in terms of that um, um, uh, process in England and Wales that the Scottish legislation is going through now with such a wide scope. And what was really helpful, I think, in the, um, in the Scottish Bill is the very clear definition of the group of offences this applies to, the, the definition of sexual activity, which was missing in England and Wales. The, the English and Wales um, process, uh, basically, uh, because it's built on the 2012 Act, looks at uh, um, offence by offence and doesn't really consider actually what are the processes, um, um, uh, what, what's the actual type of persecutory offence that we should be looking at here. That seems to be the approach that have been, is being taken by the Home Office team at the moment. They're looking at as wide a scope as possible that would include a similar definition of sexual activity, uh, excluding those uh, offences that would still be um, illegal today. Um, so my hope is that there will be parity and it, it is really helpful that, that um, this legislation is passing there because that is a live activity at the moment and we do expect a regulation to come out of the Home Office at some point this year. That's very helpful. Thank you. <coughs> Paul, your comments there just tie into something important which was in my open remarks to Gillian actually about the use of language and how language uh, we need you know, we need to update that use of language. But that language was used in actual convictions at the time. So there, there'll be people who will have been, have a conviction for breach of the peace, but it would have been something else. Yeah. And if you look at, um, if you look at the language in the Army Act, uh, section 64 and 66, and I'm going to read this because it's absolutely horrendous and it gives us a really good example. But every officer subject to military law who behaves in a scandalous manner, unbecoming of the character of an officer and a gentleman, shall on conviction by court martial be cashiered. And then 66, is any person subject to military law who is guilty of disgraceful conduct of a cruel, indecent and unnatural kind shall, on conviction by court-martial, be liable to imprisonment for a term not exceeding two years or any less punishment provided by this Act. Now, actually, in Scots law, none of those are actual terms that you would convict someone under. So that getting that language right is incredibly important to ensure that we target the right people who can have those disregards applied then to, to, the, to the records. And I wonder, if Gillian, if you could give us a wee bit of insight into um, you know, how we do that uh, and whether there's anything that you think maybe we've missed in this draft bill. I don't think there's really anything that's missed in the draft bill. I mean, I think the, the question of language is so important. I think there is a great opportunity. Obviously, once the bill comes, there will be a, a gap before it comes into place. I think what is absolutely vital is the system that's set up under government, the system of forms, the guidance that supports it. And I was going to say that in common with a lot of guidance that's given or, 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 or supporting legislation, primary legislation, it is sent out in draft to stakeholders. And I would fully endorse that you have guidance here that is perhaps issued in draft that everybody who has an interest in common, and perhaps picking up, convener, your point about language there, 
um, just as I thought it was very good that perhaps Mr Ogg was being asked if there were other categories of offences that should be included and that people were being actively asked at this stage, I would endorse that at the guidance stage of the language. What language, you know, what is offensive? You have the opportunity not to quite, I mean, I'm not saying a public consultation, but you've got the opportunity. You've got everybody, if you like, on one page. And the spirit is there. It's about getting the best that we can to support the fair society. Is that perhaps a, a, a one way of going forward about language? And again, coming back to modern legislation and drafting, which this bill picks up, is this business about being neutral as the rape, uh, the Sexual Offences Act talks about A to B. And, and that's exactly the spirit here. And I think that is so important, particularly when, although we recognise we're dealing with men here, Women obviously form groups here, but we it's not applying there because they, there's no evidence to support that they've been convicted of any offences to which this would apply. But they still that whole category is still important when we look at the, the way that language is used and the message that's been sent out for the future. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. Before I move on, uh, Derek Ogg's trial has run over, so he's uh, sent his apologies. You know, the vagaries of the law. Um, uh, Linda Fabiani. I, I have a, a very small question, that um, an issue I picked up from the, the very good Parliament research paper. I'm not, I'm not sure it would require to be in the, the primary legislation, but perhaps something in the guidance I'd like your opinion on. Uh, it's in cases of posthumous pardon. And as we've said quite, quite a lot through this evidence, there are elements of this legislation that are symbolic. And I, I would wonder about your view on families um, who have perhaps, uh, are perhaps really delighted that you know someone from their past who's now dead has been recognised as not having been the criminal that they were painted out to be, whether they should be the facility for these families, perhaps on application, to get something in writing that can say symbolically to them, you know, you were right all along, and, and here's something to prove that. And how would we do that? <laughs> One of your first real difficulties is if the person is, is deceased, there may not be a police record to say where that conviction was taking place, when it was, where did the court, etc. That, that I'm not saying it's out with the realms of possibility, but again, that would be really, really difficult to without you know because the, the chances are the record may have been deleted on the, on their death, unfortunately. Okay. Hmm. Just to come back in on a point. Thank you. It sort of follows on from that actually. I, I mean, I asked a question last week around. Um, whether uh, members of uh, relatives of deceased people could apply retrospective for disregard. This regard scheme, I believe, is only for those who are living and to which the offence uh, is relevant. Um, uh, but I guess in, in similar vein to what Linda was asking is if, if there would be an opportunity for people who, so for example, if, if someone's parent or, or brother or sister or son had, had uh, passed away and had been convicted, they may have been included in the pardon as such, but that criminal offence will still show on historic records um, where those records exist. So that person really will never have the opportunity to disregard those offences. And I wonder if there was scope for allowing uh, immediate family members or, or next of kin to, to go through that process to have those records updated in the way that a living person would. And I do wonder, within the realms of what's possible within record keeping, I'd like to think that when someone passes away and all of their criminal records disappear overnight, I'm sure that they, they exist for a period. So, um, you know, if there was some possibility to include that mechanism, <clears throat> which doesn't exist at the moment. I think it's really to add to what I said, I think it would be really difficult if the record has been deleted. If, you know, if we've been made aware that that person has deceased, that record may not exist, which would be the difficulty is where do you start with that? You know, where, where do you go? And again, it's a really difficult one. I'm, you know, I'd probably not given you the the right, the correct answer that you'd like, but I know that's the, the pardon of aspect. Obviously, still going to stand for that person, which I know is some comfort. But again, I fully appreciate you know the fact that that has been in someone's criminal record that in you know years from now someone may have the opportunity if it, if it's kept to look at. But that, that's a really difficult one without knowing if that 
record's been deleted. Um, in the in the German system, I believe that people who receive a disregard also receive a certificate, um, which again is, is symbolic, but it's a visual piece of documentation. And given they've gone through a proactive process, it wouldn't be a huge surprise to receive something in the post of that ilk. Um, <coughs> I think that would be a good idea for us to do in Scotland. I see when, it, when someone else spoke earlier, I, I, I thought about when you, you mentioned, I think it was um, um, yourself mentioned about, about how you're going to market this and that sort of short campaign. You know, a lot of people that have been debarred because of these convictions over the years probably been came to light through the likes of making applications through a PVG scheme or Disclosure Scotland. There might be that opportunity there in the fact is that in the Disclosure Scotland, when someone's going through that application, is to highlight, you know, if the act, when, if it's there to say, you know, you may think you're not able to do this, but here you go, here's an application. And that might be another longer term marketing opportunity to signpost them towards that. And again, if you had that on there, if someone's then making an application for a disclosure certificate, that that's it then, you know, it shows that that's, that's not there. So I'm not, I, I fully appreciate there's a symbolic aspect to this, but... To be practical, it's something that that's going to give them that opportunity to do things that they may not have been able to do previously. So it's just it's just a point that might be a practical term to take it forward. Andrews, um, just talking about enhanced disclosures. Thanks very much. It's nice to say, have you here? Um, obviously, organisations will have had reports back with information on it about offences that other pe that people have put down, which are no longer offences. But there's going to be quite a lot of organisations out there that have these records with them and how do we go about making sure that we get to those records as well whether it be social worker football coaches or whatever who maybe that's sitting with different organizations i think maybe just to add on what i said there i think it's probably that that marketing and, and, and awareness raising to say you need to redo this you need to you know if, if you've gone down that road of getting that that disregarded there's that opportunity to reapply for that and make sure that that's a correct correct record that's available to 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 those people so uh, it's a really, really difficult one, but it's trying to tell people, you know, you need to do this, that where you've been previously debarred, let's make sure we get it right. Yeah. And that, what the other sort of a point is, people may now not be doing going for that position because the, it's been on the record, but the records are still going to exist within organisations. So historically, or if anyone was to look through those records, it'll say, oh, well, Annie Wells didn't get this job because of X, but that record is still going to be live within organisations. I don't know how we go about making sure that that that's... Look, Section 10B removes it from all organisations. It requires the keepers of those records to yeah, remove them. How, how do you go to tell the organisations to remove the right. records? So do you know what I mean? So it's, oh, it's actually, if, <laughs> if it was me to apply and I've asked for enhanced disclosures to apply for jobs, they're still going to be sitting there. So how do we get to the organisations to ask them to remove it? P presumably, Disclosure Scotland will have records of where um, a, an enhanced disclosure has been provided. So therefore, there is an opportunity to be proactive on that to contact, presumably, those organisations that have received an enhanced disclosure about mm. that individual as part of the process. So I would suggest that might be the, the best mm -hmm. way to achieve that. Plus the fact that there is um, a, a big part of uh, what... Uh, Disclosure Scotland do now is the protection of vulnerable groups uh, scheme, which means that they are, uh, it's a continual monitoring process. So the removal of uh, these offences from people's records um, in central records will actually trigger an update on the uh, pr protection of vulnerable groups scheme. Um, what it doesn't do is push that through into the employer organisations and I, I think you're right that there is a challenge around that but it becomes a part of the marketing and indeed education campaign that would need to go with the bill um, to make sure that uh, all organisations who are recipients of uh, police information even if they have it historically that they, they need to action their own records um, as they, they're required to do under the Data Protection Act. I would again endorse what's said about the marketing and education. The only question I would raise is that in a situation of a failed job application, there will be rules applying to the information that can be kept on matters. So to an extent, after a period of time, they'll be deleted. But I'm not taking away from the fact that you don't want it there in the first place. But I think there will be a safeguard coming in because 
obviously, once someone hasn't got a job, there will be a very limited period that information is kept and would, should be deleted from the record. And probably, um, you know, somebody that's involved in employment areas would be best to give some kind of indication of what the rules applying would be. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think that, that throws up an interesting uh, area where we should uh, direct some questions as to the PVG scheme and how that would work. And also, there's usually a cost implication to accessing the PVG scheme, so we'd need to maybe investigate that as well. But we can, we can talk about that, uh, that in a wee while. I've got Mary Fee and then Alec O'Hamill. It's just a, a brief follow-up question to the question that um, Linda asked about posthumous pardons. Because personally, I think there should be a mechanism in place where families can apply for a, a disregard when someone has been convicted. Um, and I appreciate you may not give me a different answer than you've given to Linda, <laughs> but I'm going to ask you the question anyway. Um, th there will be cases where individuals have taken their own lives because of conviction. So families have had to live with the distress of a conviction mm -hmm. and the distress of a family member taking their own life. And, and personally, I think there should be a mechanism where that family are allowed to go through a process of, of, of getting that conviction removed to give them some comfort and peace. And I'd be interested in your views on whether that should, that's something we should look at. So, I, mean, um, I, th I, I agree. I think that there will be cases. There will probably be actually quite a small handful of cases as well, but important handful of cases where families would want to do this. Um, I wonder if it, um, if it, is feasible to develop a process where, whereby even if the answer is after searching records that those records no longer exist, at least the family can have that confirmation and a reconfirmation that their loved one has been pardoned under the automatic pardon. Because actually, that although there's an administrative process there, it would be quite simple to do and probably would only be for a, a small group of people, but so important for that small group of people. Interesting. Yeah. Any other views? I think it would be back to that, you know, if the record didn't exist, and I know I'm repeating myself, but again, and I, but I actually take on board, it, that would be something that you could say, well, actually, that record doesn't exist at all, you know, and I suppose that is something that, again, would be maybe some comfort. So there should be some way of communicating that to the family? Yeah, I would, I would say, I would say that, that could be possible quite easily, you know, the fact that there's no record existing, you could return that by, by doing a quick check. Right, OK, that's helpful, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, the section uh, 10, um, gives, which is about the removal of disregarded convictions from official records, will give comfort to applicants that evidence of that conviction is being expunged from anyone who holds it. Um, but it occurs to me there are aspects of the conviction which are recorded which are not actually about the conviction themselves. So, for example, I think this is the principal example I'd like to focus on, is, um, is in the small number of cases where chemical castration was part of uh, the conviction process, and that famously happened to Alan Turing, to avoid prison he undertook that. So there will be a record of that chemical castration in medical records. Should we, through this legislation, offer applicants the opportunity not just to expunge their criminal record, but to have things redacted from medical records as well? Because at the moment, patients only have the right to have notes attached to their medical records if they dispute something in their medical records, but they don't have the right to have something redacted. Is this the place that we should address this and I'm open to anybody here um, again you have to I suppose have a look at terms of what the scope of this is I think if it was something that was part of a criminal sentence you know there's there's potentially something that brings it within scope but I think if there were other things you'd have to be really you know careful that we weren't um, leading into to other areas as I say there's, there's no doubt that there are other discriminatory practices and, and things held elsewhere but I think this is about um, the second part with disregard is, is, is I suppose very practical it's about uh, removing um, um, convictions which are can be a barrier to people even today having that so it was done for a very particular um, purpose and obviously if there's a record of that conviction um, I, I think you would have to be I suppose very careful about how far you widened that I suppose the same could be said for the fact that someone was convicted and they were sentenced to a period of imprisonment you then enter the prison records as well and any medical records that were held by them could be slightly different so you, I suppose as, as my colleague said it's that wider aspect of where, where do you stop 
I think, I think the important thing about medical records is that sometimes other parties have access to your medical records, particularly insurance companies, things like that. Whereas prison records, you can be pretty confident that people aren't going to go digging around in those. And to my mind, I ask this question because you may have some people who so fervently want to have the state recognise that they did nothing wrong, want to remove any record of it from the personal records that follow them. And I think medical records are the only other really real example of where it could have a material impact on people's judgment of them as a character and they might fiercely want to have that redacted and I just wonder if we should give them that opportunity through the tenets of this legislation oh, Paul? I, I, I think, I mean, clearly it's a, a good principle I think, um, again, you're right to point out that it may be a, a small number of cases uh, and I guess it would be useful to think through how that process could work um, and what administration, what other organisations it would need to bring in um, to to allow medical records to be redacted. I haven't really thought about it, but um, yeah, essentially I, I would agree with the principle. Great. And, and Convener points out that the same is true for conversion therapies and psychiatric treatment orders and the rest of it, all of which Indeed. have very sort of pregnant meaning on mm. medical records that mm. people would be very keen to see redacted. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Convener. I've got um, a, a couple of questions, and we, we ventured into this earlier about the use of legal aid, but also about the appeals procedure. And I noted that there's been no appeals uh, on the disregard uh, scheme uh, in England. And is that just because it was a, a, a seamless, easy process, or you know, has there just not been the opportunity to do that? Um, and whether we've got it right, you know. Um, where we are. I know the Law Society made some comments on this, so I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you on this, Gillian. But uh, to get that sort of a comparison with uh, English Wales legislation and, and our proposed legislation? I have to admit that we, we haven't actually spoken to um, any individuals who have had their um, rejection. I mean, that there are some individuals we've spoken to. So, for instance, the, the, the case study I talked about earlier about the, the man in 1995 convicted on Section 32. He clearly is, um, he saw no, there was no route for legal appeal because it was very clear that the, the, the offence he was convicted under was out of the scope of the, um, of the law and that was made clear to him in the uh, communication about his rejection. Uh, so he's pursued that as a, as a, a campaign with his MP, uh, which we've supported. Uh, I suspect that that's probably the case for the other um, 268 um, applications that have been rejected, that um, the Home Office have been very clear about why they've been rejected. Um, in most cases, it's because they've been out of scope of the legislation. So a lot of them actually were, uh, were not offences that are related to historic sexual offence convictions. Um, um, and so are still illegal today. Uh, so some so some examples are very clear, but other ones um, like the importuni offence were just as there were simple loopholes in the law, um, and the law needed to be changed. So I suspect that because that communication has been very clear from the Home Office, people have decided there was absolutely no point in appealing. Um, so they actually it's been a very um, difficult process for them because they've taken the proactive step to try and get their conviction disregarded only to find that the, the state is still saying no no we're keeping it in place um, and that is very difficult of course there were a lot of um, cases rejected because they are still illegal today so there were a number uh, particularly there's a large group um, of cases that were rejected because they were offences sexual offences committed in the public lavatory which is obviously still um, illegal today um, so again that group um, uh, uh, a group of 81 people um, who have been rejected on that basis don't have any recourse for appeal which is probably why they haven't um, uh, done so Thank you. Gillian, the, the Law Society went into some detail in their submission around about appeals and the use of legal aid and what other support was available. Uh, can you give us some insight into your thoughts on that? Yes, I mean, uh, again, I had a look at the English equivalent and, I mean, clearly there is a process involving the court that um, an applicant can make and that's 
obviously a good thing. I suppose my only concern was that why would this be anything different from any other process going to a sheriff? A sheriff can be appealed in the normal order and clearly while you might not want it to be appealed to, um, to the court of session, there is a sheriff appeal court that could be there. Now, I'm not I think it probably is more in the theory than the practice of looking at the English examples that you've talked about, but it was only a query when obviously the committee had this opportunity to consider was whether you wanted the court to have that finality. I mean, I do appreciate that the mechanism would be that if it fails, then you could, and there was more information available, you could make a new application. So I do understand that there is another way back through the process. So it's not one that we had a strong view, but it was really, why should it be different? And and that's the only concern I had against that. You don't want things trundling through. But it is very clear what the sheriff has to do. So it should be more or less clear to a sheriff. I was only thinking if a sheriff gets it wrong, there is no further mechanism. It would be back to a new application with new information. OK, that that's, that's clears that question up in, in, in my head. Um, the other question I've got is uh, to Police Scotland, and it's in your evidence, and it's the conclusion at 6.1, and you, you, you use the term victims, um, and I'll read it so that you understand what I mean. These processes gathering and compiling relevant historical and associated inf information on the subjects, and if possible, victims could enable ministers to arrive to a position where all relevant records are identified, and it goes on. But you put victims in inverted commas, and that just jumped out at me as to well, what do you mean by victims, uh, and, and maybe you can explain that to us. Um, it's really just about the fact that this was trying to point you in the direction of the art of the possible um, and the fact that the, the records and the information uh, could be examined and a determination made as to whether or not uh, that related to someone being persecuted for their uh, sexuality or whether in fact um, they were acting in a, a sexual predatory fashion. Um, so therefore it brings into uh, question the the other party who may have been uh, involved in what was purported to be the offending uh, behaviour or not. So it means that there was either a victim or somebody who was party to that activity. Now, uh, within the records, it might be a case of um, two people would have been charged with the same <coughs> offence at the same time and therefore were, were party to it, in which case it's not a victim. In other circumstances, it may be, um, as Stuart alluded to, um, where it was somebody abusing uh, power or there was an age-related issue in it, in which case you do have what would be referred to as a victim. OK, that, that clears that up perfectly, thank you. <laughs> uh, any other questions from panel members? Have we exhausted everything this morning? We, I think we have, and we've, we've had uh, superb responses that have really helped us un understand uh, a bit more where we need to go next and some avenues to investigate. Uh, can I say a grateful thanks from the committee this morning for all of your, your oral evidence, which, is, as I say, has been incredibly helpful, and your written evidence. And if you go away and you think, I should have said something, I should have said that, please let us know, because we're continuing on with this for another few weeks anyway, uh, until we get it right for a stage one report. So anything that you can offer us would be uh, gratefully received. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So moving into agenda... So I will now suspend the committee to move into private.